Welcome to the M&A Unplugged podcast. Our mission is to help you be better prepared for your business acquisition or sale. Being prepared will ensure you maximize returns and minimize risks. This is M&A Unplugged with your host, Dominic Rinaldi. Welcome back. I'm Dominic Rinaldi, host of the M&A Unplugged podcast. Did you know that over 95% of businesses in the U.S. fail to reach 1 million in annual sales? According to our guest today, it's not for lack of a great idea, but rather in the implementation and execution. Brett Trainer is a B2B expert who specializes in helping owners understand if they have the mindset for growth and develop a plan to scale their business. He's also the host of the popular B2B Founder podcast. Brett shares some great insights and nothing more valuable than how to be customer centric. You won't want to miss Brett's thoughts on how to think about your prospects and clients. What business owner doesn't want to grow their business? I know you'll enjoy listening to Brett's perspective. Before we get into today's episode, if you want to avoid common deal pitfalls, the risk of losing substantial dollars, you need to know how ready you are for a transaction. Because I believe proper preparation is so critical to your deal success, I have developed a five-minute assessment that will allow you to immediately gauge how ready you really are to buy or sell a business. You can access these free assessments and other free resources on our website at k2advisor.com forward slash resources. Being prepared is critical to ensuring that you maximize returns and minimize risks. Thank you for being here and hope you enjoyed today's episode. Hey, Brett, welcome to M&A Unplugged. So glad to have you here. Oh, Dominic, it's my pleasure. Big fan of the show. So I'm, I'm super excited to be on it today. Well, thank you so much. I'm a big fan of your show as well. So I'm excited to dive into how businesses can grow and, uh, and, and some of the things that you've built and developed. But let's start off with a quick bio on yourself, if you could give everybody your background there. Yeah, absolutely. And I can give it to you in the, the short order. But, you know, I hate to admit it's been almost 30 years now in, in the workforce and almost all of it has been in the, the B2B space, the business to business space. For the most part, I've bounced back between enterprise, large enterprise and the startup world. So I guess I got burned out with one, went back to the startup and, and ping ponged. But, you know, I think my background's a little bit unique from an enterprise perspective that I either was an operator or led almost every function within the go-to-market space. So, you know, sales, marketing, customer success, or what they used to call account management, demand generation is a relatively new term, but I had the opportunity to run those. So it gave me perspective of what works within each of those functions, but also probably more importantly, what doesn't work specifically between the two, right? When the different functions don't work together, it just creates a lot of problems. So, about five years ago, that's hard to believe it's been that long, I moved into management consulting because I wanted to kind of apply what I've learned right over the course of my career and help, at that point, enterprise and mid-market companies and spent about two years working with firms on what I would call digital transformation, transformation but it was really just helping them modernize you know, and improve their, their go-to-market functions um, after about two and a half three years of, you know, screaming at the mountaintops, hey, you need to change, it's coming, your customers and expectations are changing, you have to, to get with it. Uh, I moved back into the startup space. And for the last two years, two plus years, mostly been focused on coaching and mentoring B2B startup founders and really helping them build uh, what I would call a modern go-to-market organization, right? So, rather than try to fix or pivot, you know, how do you build the right infrastructure to build a, a scalable company? And then most recently, um, I've actually jumped into the world of venture capital, and now we're all actually be investing in early stage, you know, B2B startups. So put my money where my mouth is. So if I'm going to help these companies, why not put some, some money in there to help me? So yeah, it's been quite a journey. I'm super excited. And then, you know, Better late than never in finding your passion and career path, but uh, 
but it's led me here. So well, that's awesome. And and you bring, like you said, a wealth of knowledge from all the different functional areas, which uh, is tremendous. And I'm so excited to unpack all of this with you because whether you're, you know, a business that does a half a million dollars or a million dollars or three million, understanding the elements and the foundations of how you grow your business is so important. One last thing before we dive in, though, uh, you're also a fellow podcaster, right? You launched your own podcast about a year ago, correct? Yeah, about a year and a half ago. This, uh, I think this week will be episode 70. Um, been consistent one episode a week for, yeah, the last 18 months. And it's been, been quite the journey. It's anybody's interested in checking out, it's the B2B founder podcast. And it's really about helping, you know, B2B founders and, and small business owners with growth, right? If you're looking for supply chain and manufacturing, some of those other areas, this probably isn't the show for you. But if you're interested in how to, to learn to grow and scalable growth, that's really what we focus on. Yeah, and I've had the opportunity to listen to a couple of your episodes. You have some great guests. You cover some awesome stuff. And, you know, I think it's a great launching pad to what we're going to talk about today because in my world, uh, people come to us and they want to sell their businesses. And I'm sure this is not going to shock you or anybody in the audience, but invariably people come to us and they want a market opinion of value around their business And more often than not, they're shocked at what the value is. And uh, not because it's on the high end of what they thought, but because (laughs) it's not meeting their expectations. And time and time again, I talk about the need to prepare ahead of time and get a market opinion, you know, as early as you possibly can, and then get it updated every couple of years. And in addition to that, understand what it takes to grow your business. And I think this is where you come in. Uh, I read an interesting statistic. I think it was on your website that 95%, over 95% of businesses fail to get to a million dollars. I mean, that's shocking to me. I mean, that's just, I mean, I I didn't know that statistic and that I knew it was high, but I didn't know it was 95%. Can you talk a little bit about that and what's behind that and why people, you know, never get past the micro business stage? Yeah, I mean, that, that's a, a stat that kind of really surprised me. It kind of became my mantra that, you know, I don't believe it's an idea problem. I believe it's more of an execution issue, right? That, you know, the next step of that stat is less than 1% actually get to 10 million. So, you know, it's really what I thought. It was, it was interesting. That number was always interesting to me. And I tried to figure out, is it just arbitrary? What is it about the million dollars and 10 million that's, you know, that set that threshold? And what I found out by interviewing um, founders that actually scaled their businesses beyond those measures, it really wasn't a set number per se. What I found to a person was they got stuck in their business when they weren't expanding beyond their current network, right? So if you've been in business a long time, you know a lot of people, you can sell a lot of products to those folks, assuming that they have the need. But once that network ran out, then they either were able to expand into other, not other markets, but to reach people that didn't know them or they didn't. (laughs) And I think that's what happens with a lot of those businesses. They can't get beyond that threshold. They burn out and and go away. So that's where I've turned a lot of my focus now is how do we get beyond the people that, you know, and frankly, if you can't sell it to the people that know or know you, then your long-term prospects probably aren't good. So let's assume that, that everybody can sell within their own network, but so yeah. I'm, cur- I'm curious, is that, does that happen uh, because owners are the chief salesperson in their businesses and they don't bring on salespeople, they don't know how to, you know, build a marketing function? Is, is that what happens there? Yeah, I think it's a combination. I think the owners um, and founders that are the chief sales officer do really well, right? In the early days, you should be out leading those charges. You know, I'm sure, Dominic, when you started your business, you were the lead salesperson and really got to know what's resonating, what's not resonating, why are people buying? But when you try to scale that business, you know, I like to refer to the old days of sales, right, where customers and prospects relied on the salesperson for their information and their product features and their pricing. Well, those days are gone, right? You, you've got to have that, that information on you, digitally, right? Your website, your social media, you need to be able to tell your company's story 
digitally before anybody even talks to you. Now you could hire some really good salespeople that will win deals and help you grow your business. But the way I look to look at that is it's kind of hand to hand combat, right? They're going to go, they can probably hit their quota, but is that really going to help you scale the business? You're going to have to bring 200 salespeople to get to the, the numbers that you want to get to. And really when I kind of talked about the modern version, right? You really have to be digitally and where your customers are looking for you, right? They're looking to solve a problem first thing they're going to do is go to Google, right? <laughs> and if you don't appear on those searches, it's going to be really hard to get that traction. So mm -hmm. there's definitely still a role for the salesperson and how do we close it? I think it's changed a little bit, but if you don't have the digital capabilities, it's going to be really hard to scale your business. Yeah, I have to say in my several decades of analyzing thousands and thousands of businesses and helping owners sell their businesses, uh, I'm always shocked at um, the lack of sales and marketing prowess in so many companies. And you do come across companies where the owner, you know, w was an old sales guy and he knew how to do it and knew how to build it. But a lot of people start their businesses because they had a great idea or they took it over from, you know, an older generation and they don't have some of those fundamental skills uh, in sales and marketing and they fumble along and they have an okay business, but it never bro broke through the ceiling, whether it's the million dollar ceiling or the $5 million ceiling, because they could never figure out that sales and marketing uh, piece of the business. Yeah, no, I think you're right. And I just think, you know, I, I talk a lot about how the buyer expectations have changed, right? I mean, I look early in my career, really going to date myself. So this is before the internet bubble for a software company. I ran an outbound lead gen team. And really I had college age plus students on the phones making outbound calls, you know, all day long, 140 people doing nothing but making outbound. That's how we made our number. Wow. Do that today, you know how many voicemails you're going to get and the lack of people you're going to get. So it's just, you know, the buyers have changed the way they want to, you know, buy from you. And so the whole businesses have to shift. And so I'd say probably in the last five years, that's really changed. And now with the, with the pandemic, where I used to say, hey, buyer preferences, it's changing. You're not going to be able to get away with some of these things. It's fundamentally changed. It's not coming back. Yeah, it's not, <laughs> right? yeah. So yeah, that, that horse has left the barn. So let, let, let's maybe break down an example. So a, a business that maybe, you know, comes to you and is doing somewhere between 500 and, a, you know, million dollars in annual revenues, and they've been stuck there for, you know, many, several years or many years. How do you approach that client? What, what are you doing with them to help them, you know, understand why they're there and then break through it. And do you follow a, a common framework for that discussion? Yeah, I think, you know, no two businesses are the same, but I think fundamentally they are <laughs> right. And, you know, and it's super simple. And I know some of my more sophisticated marketing friends get on me, but you know, at the end of the day, your, your business or your product, you know, what problem is it solving for the customer? How does it solve it? Most importantly, how is it solving it differently than the competition? And then do you have proof points, right? Can you prove that it works like that? And it still amazes me the number of companies that are leading with features and benefits or the latest in technology. And frankly, customers don't care. So one of the first things I do is in a workshop or you know, now it's digital type of, of meetings is really Let's understand who your customers are, what pain points are you really solving for those customers, and then we can start to build out from there. So I'm, I'm a real big believer starting with the customer first, mm. understanding the problem you're solving. And if you've only got to, you know, say half a million dollars in revenue, is the market any bigger than that, right? Mm -hmm. So is the problem you're solving any bigger? You've tapped out 90% of the cases, the market is much larger than that. They're just not reaching those customers. So that's usually step one. And then step two, let's just take a look at your uh, competition, right? You shouldn't necessarily be copying what they do, but you really do need to understand, you know, what is their positioning in the marketplace? How are they going to market? Because really the last thing that you want is to be saying the exact same thing as your competition. And, and one of the things, and you probably hear this too, is, well, we do it better. 
eh, better is really hard to prove. You've yeah. got to be exponentially better yeah. um, or our technology is better, which used to be a differentiator. But now if you have a good technology and it works, you know, three months later, somebody else is going to have that technology. Mm -hmm. And my biggest pet peeve is, is pricing. We're cheaper. And that's a race to the bottom as well. So it's really digging in and understanding what your differentiation is. And surprisingly, I think the fear from a lot of business owners is, man, what if we're not different, yeah. <laughs> right? If there is no differentiation, if you've grown your business that far, you're obviously doing something right and there's something different. So it's really just drilling into it, whether it's experience, the people, right? Whatever the value add that you're adding throughout the process. So to me, those are the two really fundamental things. If you can't answer those questions, then it's going to be really hard to scale your business without having clarity around those. Got it. Got it. And so um, if you realize that, you know, you, if, you, if you get to the point where somebody's got um, a, a differentiating product, uh, they understand who their client is, there's enough of a market, where are you going from there with the client to then, you know, help them execute and move the needle? Yeah, I think, you know, it used to be a kind of a 10 point checklist that I had. It's now 11 because I've added um, content marketing. Right. That used to be a need to have nice to have. Oh, yeah, you've got some content to show that it's almost a cost of doing business these days. Again, more mature industries. You've been around. You've got some name recognition. It's still coming that way because I go back to the new buyers who may not be aware of you. They're going to search and whoever wins the content battle is going to be the one that's going to show up first on search. You still have to prove yourself and validate, you know, you can deliver what you say, but if you don't even show up, you're not even part of the conversation. So as much as I'd love to give you a, a, a get rich quick or, you know, a silver bullet, it's really building good content. And what I stress with companies is it's, it can't be about you uh, with the content, right? You're solving a customer for the problem. So you're helping customers understand how this works or how they can solve those problems. And oh, by the way, you happen to have that offering, right? <laughs> so it, it ties into it, but you know, kind of like what we do to the podcast, if I came on my podcast and I always talked about my methodologies and everything that I do, there's not a lot of value to that. I'm trying to give people different perspectives and that's really what you want to do with your content. So you're helping customers solve the problem and you want to become that trusted leader in solving it. So it's not going to happen overnight. Um, but assuming that becomes the foundation and then there's some different strategies and tactics you can do with outreach to get into um, unknown customers. Does that make sense? It does. And so this 11 uh, point checklist that you talk about, is this something that uh, is available on your site or uh, how, how can people get access to that? Yeah, absolutely. It's in, I've got a resource page on brettrainer.com, right? <laughs> B-R-E-T-T-T, -T -T, so triple T, trainer.com, and just go to the resources tab and you can oh, download awesome. it from there. It's awesome. It was, uh, it was one of those things, Dominic, where I've had, you know, the, the 20 years of putting things together, but never really formalized anything. So I had enough people ask and say, well, here's really what I'm looking at or what I'm advising is, is go through these checklists. And it's got some financial metrics on there. So if you don't understand your unit, costs and your, your lifetime value, things again that makes owners head spin sometimes, but there are certain core financial metrics you really need to understand because if you scale the business and you're not profitable on each unit, as you know, <laughs> not a lot of value, right? It's, it's, it's a, a quicker race to the, to the bottom. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So other than the content, is there one other on that list that you put, you know, at a really high level from a execution perspective that people really should pay attention to? Yeah, I would still, I think it's, it's a newer one. So if the content, that means people are starting to engage with your content, what is your process when somebody reaches out, right? Everybody's super excited at, you know, they can promise you 10,000 leads or if your content and your paid search or your outbound efforts are generating people coming to your site and reaching out to you have a process to, to manage those leads. It, it seems so simple, but I would say 80% don't have it, right? Somebody spends a lot of money to go get, you know, paid acquisition, but they've got one person that works part-time that's processing through all the leads. And you got one chance a lot of time with these new prospects coming to you. So make sure it doesn't have to be super sophisticated, yep. but have a plan and then be able to scale that as the, as the volume comes in. 
Yeah, you know, Brad, I think that's such a good point because uh, I talk to owners all the time when, when uh, we do a market opinion of value and we, we, it's more than just the numbers when we break it down. We're looking at the whole company and how they operate. And one of the questions, one of the many questions that we're going to ask is, are your systems and processes documented? Do you have, you know, systems and processes and where are they and are they in your head are they in the employees heads? You know, let's get this documented. One way to improve value, sure way to improve value is to document all of that stuff. And the other thing that that does is it makes you really think about the process. As you write it down, you you start to think, well, does this make sense? And we've been through that in our own company because we have a very clear process on how we handle any client that prospective client that calls in or emails us, it goes through, you know, a, you know, set process and it's, you know, it's done every time. And I think there's comfort. We all know exactly what's going to happen every time somebody reaches out to us. Yeah. And that's such a good point. I'm a, such a big believer in process too. Right. So if you, and that's why I think that it's scalable growth is so nuanced, right? It's not a one, you just can't do one thing. You can't hire more salespeople or you just can't hire market or do the content. You know, it is about the process. It is about a technology that makes the process more efficient. It's having the right people in those roles. And, you know, another thing that I've really, really been trying to get people to think differently about is, you know, when they mention internally, our, what's our sales process? And I try to get them to think differently about it and say, what is the buyer enablement process, right? Mm -hmm. Because too often we look internal out and said, mm -hmm. hey, well, I've got a lead management process and I've got a sales process and I've got onboarding and then I've got customer success, but they're doing it to fit into their own silos or their own processes. When you flip it and say, all right, how does this buyer actually want to buy? And then how do we move them through the process as quickly as possible? It's not a huge difference, but there is fundamental differences in the way you do it. And, and you think mm -hmm. about the potential, and again, you probably get this too, founders, business owners. Well, I need a sales guy. I need a marketing guy. I need, and if you really look at how buyers are buying, you may rethink about that differently when you look at how your process actually aligns up with, with their buying process. You may need more of a facilitator to help them get through it. At the end of the day, you still have to have somebody who has the ability to say, ask for the money in the sale, right? That's hard for some people to do. So that, that skill set's still there, but how I just encourage people, my long-winded answer, sorry, <laughs> is to don't think of it in silos between, you know, SDRs or sales, marketing, success. Think about it as one and what does that process look like? And then what are the people you need to help with, with that process? Yeah, and I think the other point that you were making there too is think from the outside in, right? what does our client want? What's going to be the easiest for them um, versus, you know, what do you want to deliver? Because it doesn't matter what you want to deliver. It matters how people are going to consume it and interact with you. Exactly. Right. Great, great point. So Brett, I want to, I want to wind back the table. So we're talking about growth and, and what the impediments are and, and some blocking and tackling, but as in most uh, cases, sometimes, the owner is their own worst enemy, right? They get in the way, you know, we, you and I are business owners, we get in our heads, right? And so there's a psychological aspect to, am I even ready for growth? Like, do I, how do I know uh, if I, I, I'm ready to be a $10 million business? How do you go in and assess whether or not somebody, you know, forgetting about the market, whether or not it's big enough and forgetting about the competition, how do you go in and assess whether or not that owner really has the right mindset to grow their business? Yeah. And the desire, that's such a good point. And, and, you know, I've worked with both, right. They said, yeah, I really do want to scale. And I found even some of the business owners that have scaled beyond where they have to get themselves out of the day-to-day processes, right? If they're involved in the day-to-day -day process, it's almost impossible to, to scale your business. And even though they wanted to get out, it was really, really hard for them to let go, right? <laughs> it took time. And again, through my interviews, I found they wish they would have done it sooner, but it, sometimes it just takes their baby. It's hard to let go. But once they finally realize that they're bringing in smart people, and it may not be the exact way they do it, but it's going to grow and it's going to grow. Hey, I'm going to other... raise my hand. I'm, I'm one of those. Uh, having run this business for a couple of decades, I, I was the rainmaker for many years and I had my hands in a lot of, 
a lot of the different aspects of the business. And uh, about five, six years ago, I, I decided that, you know, I was going to start to turn over a lot of that. And uh, my business is completely different. No surprise. Yeah. And it was probably hard. I mean, it took, it takes a while and you've got to have the confidence that you're, you're you got to have the right people. In. You got to have the right people. You got to know that they're trained. You know, it, it, it doesn't happen overnight. You don't just wake up one day and say, oh, I'm going to have a self-managing business. You wake right. up and there's a lot of hard work to get there, but uh, it matters. Yeah. And, and just to close out on your point, because there are business owners and founders that just really like working and doing that part of the business. And so even though they think they want to scale, they really don't want to scale. Right. And it sometimes it takes a little while to get to that point. And, you know, some get through it, some don't. I don't know if there's any quick tips that I could give you. One, if they acknowledge that they're not sure they're ready to do this, they probably aren't. Yeah, right. <laughs> right? You, right. You probably went through a few stages, but yeah. And it's, it, I think that's the other thing. It's not going to be a, a quick hit. You got to look at processes. Mm -hmm. People are going to do things differently, but as long as you can continue to share the, the vision and the passion that allowed you to get it to that point, and then the people can buy into what you're selling, I think those are the businesses that succeed. It's where the, the owner has been able to transition into that leader versus the Right. head doer yeah. <laughs> yeah. so. going back to the psychological piece so, so you're you're going in and, and i imagine that's your first stop right is that owner is that owner really ready exactly and do you follow, and it, do you follow up uh, uh, any formula do you have a checklist for this anything that you that you go through that tells you whether or not that owner is you know ready no, I mean, and in, in, if you have a secret formula to figure this out, I'm, please share it with me. It's just more, you know, experience and asking the questions and really gauging how uh, engaged they are within moving away with what they're going to have to. It's really just painting a realistic picture like you just did. It wasn't easy. It was hard. I moved away, but I made the commitment to be able to do this. And they just need to be able to look at themselves in the mirror and say, am I ready to do this? And if the answer is no, you know, no harm, no foul. Yeah. We'll move on. But here's the things, right? Here's what you need to be able to do to step away from your business and get the right people in the right roles to help you grow it. You absolutely can still be involved. And I'm sure in bigger deals, you're still part of, of that process. And so I, I don't want to paint the picture that, hey, if you're stepping away, you're out of it for good. No, it's just you can't be the bottleneck anymore. Right, right. right. Can't be the decision point. And, and so. And by I the way, it, it takes a huge monkey off your shoulders. I mean, to have other people that you trust and you know can do the job frees you up to go pursue things that you love to do uh, in the business and create new networks and create new opportunities. Uh, all boats rise in that tide if you use your time wisely. You know, exactly. our, our analogy in our business is... Um, one of the big challenges we have is, is an owner really ready to sell their business? No, I bet. And, yeah. and, you know, when we first meet with people, you know, we'll try to ask them a number of different ways. Like, you know, one of our classic questions is, you know, what would you do if you sold the business? And if somebody says to me, I have no idea, I really worry that they might not be ready. Uh, right. it's a statistic I've, I've stated before on the show which is um, over 75% of owners that sell their businesses are remorseful that they sold the business. And it had nothing to do with how much money they received for the business, but it had everything to do with whether or not they knew what their next phase of life looked like. Okay. Uh, conversely, if an owner comes in and says, I've got, you know, a farm and I've got nine grandkids and we're going to have them out, you know, like, that owner is already thinking about the next phase and it doesn't have to be retirement. I could have an owner that right. says, I've got an idea for a new business. I'm already launched. I, I, I'm putting money into it. You know that they're moving in that direction. So they're ready to move away from this business, but I have to hear those sorts of things to know that people are psychologically ready because right. you know, it's a long process to sell a business. Like I'm sure it's a long process to help somebody grow a business and you have to be ready for what's ahead of you and be committed to the process. Cause if you're not, you're never going to grow it or you're never going to sell it. Exactly. And just to maybe, even though it wasn't, I wouldn't say it's on a checklist, one kind of 
telltale point is when you get a chance to interview the employees of that small business mm. and ask about the owner, you'll get a pretty good gauge of how, and, and controlling may not be the right word, but in some cases it is, right? You'll get a sense of how involved and how deep they are in the day to day. And that's going to give you an idea of how hard you're going to have to get them to, to, to step away. So I don't think it's a one size fits all, but I think the current employees will give you a good sense of, um, the amount of effort <laughs> yeah, that you're yeah. going to make that transition. Yeah, the old 360 review uh, process, right? Uh, go and talk to everybody else. And, uh, right. Well, and it, isn't it true? Most business owners have A type personalities and they're drivers and controlling. And, you know, look, you have to have that element in you in order to start a business and grow it, right? Exactly. But hopefully. Well, that's why, and I don't have this statistic offhand, but the number of founder CEOs that end up stepping away from the CEO role when the business starts to scale is just because it's a, it's a different mindset. It's a different, you know, not a skill set. It's about desire too, right? I mean, you're starting getting deeper in the operations and all the things that you're not doing as a startup founder. And, yeah. you know, one of my most classic examples, I interviewed a guy who was on Shark Tank, Martin Hill, and he invented a product called the Bebo, <laughs> right? And it was just, uh, you know, so dads could, you know, help breastfeed, it was a gizmo, the whole long story short. So struck a deal on, on Shark Tank, got a deal, but he never had an intent of, of building and running a company, right? He wanted, to, he's a product guy. He likes to invent, he wanted to move right. on to the next product. So by the time that episode actually aired, his company was, was a for sale already. Scaled it, but he's like, you know, that's not my skill set. It's not what I want to do. And man, I think back to your original point, I think if more owners and founders really sat down and thought about what they wanted yep. and what makes them happy, it's going to yep. make the process much easier. Yeah. You know, it, it, understanding what your skill set is and what your desires are is so important. I'm involved in a uh, coaching program, strategic coach, uh, Dan Sullivan. And one of the things that they bring you through is what are your unique abilities? So not only what are you great at, but what do you love to do? And, and everything is focused on get you in that quadrant and get rid of everything else. Because oh, you might be good at something, but you hate doing it and you're never going to do it. So only focus your time as a business owner in the places that you're really good and things you love. And, uh, I'll tell you what, that once you get to that point that both psychologically and, you know, you can get there physically, it's, uh, it, it, it's very energizing. Um, yeah. I really believe in that. Well, I can tell you, I mean, for me, it took me what, 48 years, maybe 30 years in corporate <laughs> to really figure out what I like to do. I mean, you know, I took the last five trying to figure out exactly. Now I think I'm in a really good spot. And if I would have been more intentional about this, maybe, 15 years ago, I know they say better late than never, but I do think, are you starting, I'm just curious from your perspective, are you starting to see more owners having more kind of, I call it self-awareness, if you will, of what they want to do, or is it still, no? No, <laughs> no. Okay. no we're not. Uh, and look, I, and that's not an absolute, right? I'm not broad, uh, painting a broader, sure. here, but by and large, um, owners tend to be, too involved in their businesses. They, they tend to be the chief salespeople, strate all strategic decisions have to go through them, sometimes all decisions. And the business can't grow that way. You can't right. develop people. Um, you, know, you, you just have worker bees. You don't have people who can think and be strategic and move the needle for you. And uh, I see that way too often. Yeah. Yeah. Well, one day at a time, one owner at a time, right? <laughs> exactly. So Brett, um, this has been tremendous. I really appreciate all the info. Um, and I know your principles apply to whether somebody has less than a million dollars or a million to 5 million. If you're stuck somewhere, the question is, how do you grow? And what are the basic principles? And I know these apply. But if you were to offer one piece of advice to all owners out there that are looking to move the needle on their business, what's the one thing that you would, you would tell people? Always align with the customer, right? You can't go wrong. And I know we talked a little bit about understanding why they buy, but, you know, I, I encourage them across the entire journey, you know, look at the customer insights and really, really understand your customers inside and out. The better you do, the better you're going to be able to sell to them because you can relate. You can have better conversations. You can offer them better products. 
you'll understand from a service perspective if they're happy or if they're not happy. And again, it seems, this just seems so intuitive and straightforward that all businesses do it, but I would say, you know, 80% don't. Yes. So if you can align with your customers and your desired customers, you know, that's, that's priority one and the rest gets easier after that because then, you know, at least <laughs> right who you're, who you're dealing with and, and what, they want. what they want. Exactly. hundred percent. Right? Yeah. It's all about what so. they want, right? Well, that, that is uh, tremendous wisdom. Really appreciate that. And uh, for folks who are listening, uh, check out Brett's podcast, B2B founder podcast. Uh, it's really, you have some tremendous guests. Uh, really enjoyed listening to a bunch of the episodes. Uh, so Brett, if people wanted to get in touch with you, how could they reach you? Yeah. I mean, I, I gave you the website. It's just, you know, brettrainer.com. Uh, LinkedIn. I spend a ton of time on LinkedIn since I work with a lot of business owners. So feel free to drop me a note again. It's just, you'll have it in the, the show notes, I'm sure. But Brett Trainer, T-R-A-I-N-O-R. There's not too many of me out there. So <laughs> you see entrepreneur, small business growth. Yeah, it, that's probably who, who it is. So, or again, I'll, I'll leave you an email. It's just bt at brettrainer.com. Drop me an email and I'm more than happy to connect and chat with anybody, anytime about, you know, growth and their strategies. Awesome. Brett, thanks so much for being here. Really a pleasure. No, Dominic, thank you. I really enjoyed being on the show. I appreciate it. Great conversation as always. And, you know, have a great rest of your day. Thanks. You too. Okay. Thanks. I hope you enjoyed this episode. All of today's information will be available in the show notes. If you enjoy our content, please remember to subscribe and review our podcast. I look forward to seeing you again on the next episode of the M&A Unplugged podcast. And until then, remember that scaling, acquiring, or selling a business takes time preparation, and the proper knowledge.